All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming to the Zicha Genesis Medicine webinar on diabetic, diabetic foot ulcers. Therapeutic angiogenesis is a revolutionary new treatment. My name is Dan Montano, and I'll be coming back to you after Dr. Jacobs has given the presentation on diabetic foot ulcers. But I wanna give a brief introduction first, just for your general information. Diabetic foot ulcers, you will learn from Jack, is a huge problem with people who have diabetes. The reason I wanna to talk to you is because most people who don't have diabetes take it for granted. And out of the approximately 30 million Americans and Canadians who have diabetes, between five and 7% every year develop a diabetic foot ulcer. That's a million and a half to 2 million people. And these diabetic foot ulcers can, about two thirds of them can be treated using wound healing methodology, bandages, antibacteria, et cetera, and they can heal. But about another third become chronic. They won't close. And these become a high risk situation because those wounds are wet, they're warm, and if they become infected, it's extremely dangerous. And it is a leading cause of amputations in the United States. The reason I mention this to you is my most wonderful aunt, who I love beyond words since she was the nicest, most wonderful person on earth, developed diabetic foot ulcers. When they would not heal, after a few years, her foot was amputated and a few months later she died. Diabetic foot ulcers are not something to be taken gently. They are working disasters. And I wanna put into your perspective, you can see this picture that Jack has put in front of you and you can see the toe, you can see that ulcer. If a small ulcer develops and it can be bandaged and it can heal, that's a good thing, except the issue is the lack of vascularization in that area. That problem doesn't go away. So that area becomes highly prone to another possible diabetic foot ulcer in the exact location. And even if the next one heals, the fundamental condition of lack of blood flow remains and those cells are still weakened and unable to grow and strengthen as they need to. We believe our treatment changes the disease. It's a disease modifying agent so that this problem of diabetic foot ulcers can be truly addressed. Now, Zicha Genesis Medicine is working on 19 indications. Three of those indications, we have phase two data. The heart, I believe is our crown jewel. We've had three amazing outcomes in human clinical trials, and I have strong belief that the heart will be our crown jewel and our biggest winner imaginable. I also believe that our treatment for diabetic foot ulcers will be the first thing that we get approved. I believe we'll get it approved because the data we have is amazing and the need is great. I believe when we submit our information to the FDA, that they will perhaps give us a breakthrough designation because millions of diabetics want something that's going to solve this problem. And I believe this will be the first drug that Zicha gets approved and will be available to all the diabetics in the world. Now I wanna introduce Dr. Jack Jacobs. Dr. Jacobs has a PhD from Washington University in St. Louis in molecular biology. He is a former employee of Hitachi Pharmaceutical. He was at Merck where he set up their biologic group. Uh, Jack is, was introduced to me by Dr. Ralph Bradshaw of University of California, Irvine, who I had tracked down because he's the number one person in the world on growth factors. I asked him who could help me develop this. He said, you've got to go to Dr. Jacobs. He's the second smartest guy in the world on this topic. And I said, no, no, I don't want the second best. I want the best. And Dr. Bradshaw informed me he was not available, but the best after him was Jack. And so because I couldn't find anybody better than Jack, we took the best we could get. 
Jack is also my personal friend now for 22 years. And if there's one thing I can say about him, I think he's one of the nicest people God's ever made. I introduce now Dr. Jack Jacobs. Jack. Thank you, Dan, <clears throat> for that nice introduction. And thank you viewers for joining us. Uh, we're broadcasting from Las Vegas. It's uh, hot and dry here, so maybe you'll see me taking a few sips of water through, through my talk. As Dan mentioned, I'm going to be talking about the use of therapeutic angiogenesis to treat uh, diabetic foot ulcers. Uh, <clears throat> we'll be talking about some results from some FDA authorized clinical trials. Uh, but before that, I'd like just to talk a bit about uh, blood vessels, blood perfusion, uh, angiogenesis, which is using a drug to stimulate uh, new blood vessels and damaged tissues, such as the diabetic foot. <clears throat> so my second slide. Uh, we have over 60,000 miles of blood vessels in our bodies. This sl slide shows uh, that. This is enough to wrap around the world three times, uh, or almost three times. And these vessels look, in this picture, pretty much the same, uh, except in size. But really, blood vessels come in all different shapes and sizes. They actually adapt uh, to the tissue where they're being used. <clears throat> these show different, these are all blood vessels, examples of blood vessels. Uh, in the liver, they've been adapted to purify the blood of toxins. <clears throat> in the lungs here, we see they've been uh, <clears throat> adapted to purify, not to purify, to exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide out of the blood. In the brain, these are these power lines supplying all the neurons in the brain. <clears throat> and here we can see in muscles, muscles are contracting. So you don't want kinks forming in your blood vessels. So here they've adapted almost like curly cues, uh, corkscrews to uh, kind of go with the movement of the muscle. Now we believe blood perfusion is very important <clears throat> for healthy tissues. And in fact, over 75 uh, human diseases are a result of impaired uh, blood perfusion. Some of those are obvious. You block a coronary artery in the heart, you're gonna get angina, maybe suffer a heart attack. Uh, in a carotid artery going to the brain, uh, stroke can <clears throat> evolve from that. And also more recently, even in the brain, disruptive blood flow in the, in the brain can lead to such uh, neurodegenerative diseases as Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. We're gonna talk about uh, the diabetic foot and how a lack of blood perfusion there leads to chronic wound healing problems. But first let's <clears throat> talk a little bit about angiogenesis. Obviously, if you wanna improve uh, blood flow to, to a tissue such as a diabetic foot, if you can increase vascularization, if you can grow new blood vessels there, this is going to increase blood flow uh, to that area. We all use angiogenesis every day on uh, healing cuts and wounds. Here's a skateboarder who's fallen off his skateboard, scraped his elbow. He's going to be using angiogenesis to heal that scrape. And let's look how that's done. So if we look, this is the skateboarder's elbow. We, Look under this wounded area, the scab here. <clears throat> here we see angiogenesis at work. These are all new blood vessels that have been stimulated to heal uh, this wounded area. So this is the same exact thing we want to do in a diabetic foot ulcer. Uh, the drug we're developing, I'll talk about it in a second, FGF1, is probably the most potent stimulator of this process of angiogenesis. You grow new blood vessels, and this heals uh, the tissue, in this case, skin, <clears throat> everything that's required to regenerate skin, uh, new blood vessels, uh, new skin cells, uh, sweat glands, hair follicles, nerve cells, uh, the whole shebang. So <clears throat> now we're taking FGF1 and using it not so much for natural angiogenesis, but we call it therapeutic angiogenesis, where we're stimulating uh, this process in damaged tissue, such as the diabetic foot. This is our product. FGF1, it's a natural product. It's probably the most potent inducer of angiogenesis of new blood vessel growth in our bodies. Let's look a bit about <clears throat> at the process of angiogenesis. So here we have uh, FGF1, a growth factor, shown as a small circle here. And that's going to bind to an FGF receptor on a blood vessel. <clears throat> so once this interaction occurs, we get an explosion of metabolic events which lead to division of these blood vessel cells and they start forming small tubules 
they mature in the capillaries. And then FGF1 is unique in that it can stimulate uh, the growth of these arteries, uh, small arteries, uh, which are surrounded by smooth muscle cells, and they actually can pump uh, more blood into ischemic tissues. Now, I'm often asked, what prevents blood vessels from growing throughout the body? If we inject FGF1, let's say intravenously, why don't we get blood vessels uh, flowing, uh, growing everywhere? And that would be a real disaster growing in our eyes or our kidneys. <clears throat> so the body has developed a way to uh, limit that, and I'll go into that process now. So here's FGF1 <clears throat> coming down to dock on its receptor. This is in a blood vessel cell. So as I just mentioned, once that occurs, you get this explosion of metabolic activities. All these uh, pathways inside the cell get activated. I won't go into that. There have been thousands of papers written on these processes, but the net result is you get cell proliferation, division of the uh, blood vessel cells and angiogenesis or the formation of new blood vessels. <clears throat> so this is an important concept to understand why the drug we're developing only works in starved tissues, uh, ischemic tissues, tissues that need more blood vessels or crying out for better blood perfusion. And let's look at in the diabetic foot, uh, over time, the foot becomes unhealthy, disease, lack of blood flow. Actually, the nerves can be damaged in the diabetic foot. And what is occurring over time in that foot <clears throat> is an upregulation uh, of the FGF1 receptor. In the healthy foot, we have uh, fine blood vessel growth. We don't need new blood vessels. Basically, the FGF system is shut down. We have few receptors. It's been uh, estimated about 100 receptors in a healthy cell. But over time, as that diabetic foot becomes diseased, here the foot is crying out for more blood flow. Uh, estimated 100,000 receptors are upregulated, but for whatever reasons, there's not enough FGF1 around to stimulate the growth of new blood vessels. So this is the diabetic foot, uh, lack of perfusion. It has the opportunity to respond to FGF1, but there's just not enough of the growth factor around. And let me just show you in the diabetic foot here, there is a significant reduction in blood flow in the diabetic foot. <clears throat> this is capillary blood flow. Here's a normal foot. And look at the diabetic foot. It's almost three to four times less blood flow in that area. So this is where introduction of FGF1 into that ischemic foot can really stimulate uh, new blood vessel growth. This is a artist rendition. Uh, so this is the upregulation of the receptors here in the diabetic foot. <clears throat> when we come along with FGF1, uh, we stimulate the growth of new blood vessels, bringing in better blood perfusion uh, in the diabetic foot. And we think this is a key reason we see healing, uh, as I'll show you in a bit, uh, in treating the diabetic foot with uh, ulcer with the FGF1. Okay, as Dan mentioned, <clears throat> we are working on 19 different medical indications. All these indications are characterized by lack of blood flow. <clears throat> uh, all can be treated with FGF1. Today, I'll talk about some clinical data uh, from clinical trials with mainly diabetic foot ulcers, but also mentioned venous leg ulcers. Uh, <clears throat> we're also starting clinical trials in the US, not in the US yet, but in Mexico and outside of <clears throat> in Europe. We've got, we've got a trial in Estonia for Parkinson's disease that's under review. Before I talk about diabetic foot ulcers, let me just show you a little bit of data, a couple slides on coronary artery disease, because we had some really nice results uh, in a US FDA clinical trial that I uh, supervised. <clears throat> and in this trial, we injected FGF1 directly into the heart of patients who are suffering from severe coronary artery disease. And in fact, we we're very successful in growing new blood vessels in their hearts. Uh, these patients improved uh, tremendously uh, in terms of their chest pain. And let's just, let me just show you, ABC News went down to our Cincinnati site, the University of Cincinnati interviewed our cardiologist, Lynn Wagner, and also some of the patients. But since receiving an experimental treatment for his blocked arteries, his pain is gone. I really feel great. Duke was one of the first heart patients in the country to be treated with a protein actually capable of growing brand new arteries. 
The genetically engineered protein is injected directly into the heart. Within days, a network of new vessels begins to grow around the blockage, increasing the blood supply. Dr. Lynn Wagner showed us the changes in one patient's heart. We see a small, narrow main artery and not very many secondary and tertiary arteries. This is after the treatment. What we're now seeing is new blood vessels growing here uh, off the, the end of this artery. And the patients themselves? Symptomatically, they're improved within a couple of weeks of the treatment. Just ask Constance Donnelly. Oh, I feel wonderful. I've never felt so good in the last five years. It's what doctors already see potential in other cases where the blood supply needs a boost, such as strokes and diabetes. Uh, just to make a note, that woman we saw there, Constance Donnelly, uh, she came in a cardiac cripple. She was in a wheelchair before the trial. After treatment, you can see how robust she seems. <clears throat> We had three dosing groups in that trial, and she was actually in the lowest uh, dosing group. So she received about one-tenth of the optimal dose that we thought would most benefit people. So it's clear that her FGF1 receptors were tremendously upregulated uh, in her heart tissue for her to respond uh, so well. <clears throat> okay, and now let's move on to uh, diabetic foot ulcers, a frequent complication of diabetes. So in the US, 30 million individuals are suffering from diabetes. Uh, every year, five to 7% of those will develop a uh, chronic diabetic foot ulcer as shown here. <clears throat> These are open wounds, they're not healing. As I mentioned, there's lack of blood perfusion in the, in the foot, diabetic foot. Uh, nerves can be damaging at this diabetic uh, neuropathy where people really can't feel much in their feet and that also leads to these wounds uh, <clears throat> forming. They can get infected, uh, and once infected, they can cause gangrene and then and move on probably to the most dreaded uh, consequence of a diabetic foot ulcer is a lower leg amputation. So we're going to use FGF1 as a topical wound healing agent by putting it directly into the ulcer, <clears throat> covering that and uh, watching its heal, healing over, in the case of a phase two clinical trial, a five month period. Before I discuss those clinical trial results, just let me give you a little uh, background on these chronic dermal ulcers. <clears throat> uh, here's a diabetic foot ulcer. Uh, it's a leading cause of diabetic ho hospitalization. This uh, diagram here shows where the diabetic fo foot ulcer is most common, and you can see here in purple, really <clears throat> the lower uh, foot, lower below the ankle. I'll talk about venous ulcers. Uh, these are large surface wounds on the lower leg, shown here. And again, they occur most commonly uh, in the calf region and below the ankle. I won't be talking about pressure ulcers, which are bed sores, which often occur in bedridden patients in the hospital. Uh, we will be developing FGF1 for this indication. Here's a bed sore, and they occur over pressure points. So someone's lying in a hospital bed these are pressure points which can develop these uh, very painful wounds. Now, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there's a reduced blood flow in the diabetic foot, uh, about threefold decreased. And let's look at the uh, <clears throat> perfusion in right around an ulcer. So here's a uh, diabetic ulcer. It's a bit hard to make out, but this is the center of the ulcer. This is the ulcer. This is kind of the healing edge. And when an ulcer heals, it develops what's called granulation tissue. This is very moist, spongy types of, a type of tissue which precedes the normal skin development. <clears throat> so let's look at this ulcer. If we look right in the center of the ulcer, look, there's basically no blood flow there, very little capillaries. And then as we move out to the granulation tissue, we can see more capillaries, more blood flow. And here's uh, the normal blood flow in the adjacent skin. And again, that's not normal. We know that in a diabetic, that's about one third of what we see, say in a normal person. So by placing FGF1 directly into this wound, we're stimulating the growth of new blood vessel, which helps the formation of this granulation tissue. Okay, before we <clears throat> FGF1 went into the clinic, uh, there were preclinical animal studies were done. Uh, 
there's a mouse which is diabetic, which has all the impaired wound healing uh, properties of diabetic patients, and that was used to establish that topical application of FGF1 was safe and tolerable. And I'll show you the topical application of FGF1 led to significant uh, increase in wound closure uh, in this animal model. <clears throat> this is what these uh, wounds look like. You actually do a punch biopsy, a round punch biopsy in the skin of these diabetic mice. And this group of animals is treated with FGF1. You can see closure of that ulcer after day 15. Uh, placebo treatment, the wound stays open. So this is a significant difference in wound healing activity. Uh, <clears throat> if you plot that out, uh, I'm not really going to go into this slide, but just look at this. This is total closure of that of those wounds and those diabetic uh, mice. So here uh, they start treating with FGF1 or placebo treatment. And I think the most remarkable thing about this graph, look here at a day 30. Basically, all of the wounds are still open in the mice that receive placebo treatment and all of the wounds have closed with FGF1. So a really dramatic and significant difference between uh, treatment <clears throat> and placebo. Um, so these are the US FDA authorized clinical trials in which FGF1 was studied. A number of phase one studies were done in normal and diabetic patients to establish that topical application of FGF1 was safe and tolerable. I'm gonna show you data from a 2A trial that established that FGF1 could, do, could increase uh, the, it could accelerate the wound healing by four to five fold. And then probably the most important study, a 2B study, where it was shown that 100% of the FGF1 treated ulcers, <clears throat> that 100% of the ulcers treated with FGF1 are uh, closed. Okay, here's the first phase two study uh, looking at acceleration of wound healing. Uh, so the wounds, the ulcers are treated at day zero. And here we see the FGF1 treated ulcers accelerating uh, in their wound healing. So more granulation tissue, more healing of those ulcers. Here's placebo treated wounds. So at this point, there's about a 4.5 difference in the healing rate. And one interesting thing about this trial, actually the FGF1 treatment stopped at this point at day 30. And look, it continued accelerating the wound healing even after the treatment was start, stopped. <clears throat> I'll now go to the 2B. Uh, this is a phase 2B trial on di diabetic ulcers where we saw 100% closure, where it was seen 100% closure by four months. Okay, so here we're seeing the fraction of open ulcers. So at the start of the clinical trial, uh, equal size ulcers were treated either with FGF1 or with the placebo dose. And as you can see, these ulcers were treated basically every other day in this clinical trial. Uh, and over time, we can see with the FGF1 and blue treated ulcers, we get to complete closure of those ulcers <clears throat> after about 130 days. Where placebo treated ulcers, about 35% of those remain open. Uh, this is a big deal. I mean, these placebo treated ulcers got excellent care. Uh, much better than most patients would get. They're seen every week uh, by a podiatrist. The wounds are cleaned, uh, debrided, which is surgical removal of any dead tissue. So they're receiving really high standard of care and still 35% of those remain open. So this is a very significant difference in terms of hospitalization, uh, medical cost, and possible infection and amputation in this uh, group of patients. This shows you an example of a diabetic Ulcer healed uh, with FGF1. Uh, this is before treatment. This is after about four months of treatment. We see healing, complete healing of that diabetic foot ulcer uh, with FGF1. Okay, so we are going to pick up the torch here and continue the development of FGF1 for diabetic foot ulcers. Uh, we plan to initiate clinical trials in the US and Mexico. <clears throat> uh, our phase two trial will be similar to the one I just showed you, the 2B trial, where topical treatment will be done uh, three times a week for five months or until complete closure of the ulcer. Uh, we've identified a principal investigator and have visited uh, some, <clears throat> up to, we've visited three high throughput sites 
of where clinical trials could be done in the US. And also different from the previous studies, we're gonna be using a commercial grade of FGF1. Uh, the previous studies were done with FGF1, which was fine for humans, but was not commercial grade, meaning was not produced in an FDA approved factory. That's important because if we get good data uh, after phase two, uh, as Dan mentioned, we're gonna be applying for a breakthrough designation uh, for unmet medical needs. Sometimes uh, drugs can be approved after phase two. And we'll certainly push for that <clears throat> uh, with FGF1 for a diabetic foot ulcer. Now, another difference uh, in, the, in our trials, we're gonna be using some newer uh, equipment, digital equipment. This is uh, a New Zealand company, Iran's, uh, makes a really nice uh, digital camera that can quantitate uh, wound size. Uh, it's called the Silhouette Star. Uh, it's basically a handheld device. You hold it over the ulcer and snap a picture. And then digitally, it <clears throat> measures the volume of the wound, which is very important. The previous clinical trials were just looking at the area. Uh, this Iran system can do the volume, so a much more sensitive and accurate uh, estimation of, of wound healing. Let me just briefly show you a few slides on <clears throat> using FGF1 to treat a venous leg ulcer. Uh, these are uh, large and very painful wounds that occur uh, on the leg. Uh, worldwide, it's estimated there are 12.5 million of these venous ulcers. In the US, 600,000 people seek treatment annually. The current standard of care is simply you wrap a bandage, it's called a compression bandage, over that wound uh, and hope that it heals. Uh, here's FGF1 in a phase of 2A. Again, not looking at complete closure, but acceleration of wound healing. And just as we saw with diabetic foot ulcers, I was assuming with diabetic foot ulcers, in blue here, you have about a twofold increase of the wound healing rate over placebo uh, in these venous leg ulcers. Uh, so additional wound healing indications that we're gonna be pursuing, uh, burns, military wounds. We've talked to uh, military personnel at the medical uh, center in San Antonio. They have very nice models of wound healing. Uh, as I mentioned, bed sores and also surgical incisions. Uh, animal studies have shown that when you heal a wound with FGF1, there's less scar tissue that forms. So this certainly could be a very important indication uh, in cosmetic surgery uh, indications. Now, I just wanna end my talk talking about uh, this commercial manufacturing of FGF1 uh, in our manufacturing site and the importance of bioengineering, genetic engineering. So. None of the studies uh, we're, we're doing could have been done without <clears throat> this bioengineering of FGF1. And basically, uh, FGF1 is grown up in these bacterial fermenters. Uh, the bacteria multiply every 30 minutes, and we can get unlimited quantities of FGF1 for our clinical trials and hopefully for commercial use. Uh, this would not be possible without <clears throat> these te technology there are very trace amounts of FGF1 in our bodies, so it's not practical to purify FGF1 from human sources. Let me show you what this technology has done. It's basically taken over the bacterial cell and is forcing the bacteria to make FGF1 as one of its major proteins. <clears throat> uh, this is something I've lived with the last 15 year, protein gels. As a biochemist, I've run thousands of these. Uh, basically take bacteria that has been made in that fermenter uh, you break it open and look at the proteins made inside of the bacterial cell. So each one of these little blue lines is this independent individual protein. We can separate those proteins by size by applying an electrical field. The proteins migrate through the gel. Uh, smaller bacterial proteins. But look, look right down here. Here is human FGF1 made, forced to be made by this bacteria. And it's forced to be its most predominant protein in itself. So it's something it didn't have before, doesn't need it, doesn't particularly want it, but we're making large quantities of bacteria in the bacteria. So we need to get rid of all these toxic uh, bacterial proteins, which can be immunogenic. Uh, over a period of weeks, we use different purification techniques, which I won't go into, 
But here at the very end, this is a pharmaceutical grade, a commercial grade FGF1, which is now ready uh, to go into clinical trials. So I'm happy to answer any questions at this point in time. And after the Q&A session, uh, Dan Montana will give his concluding uh, remarks. Thank you, Dr. Jack Jacobs. We've had a lot of questions come in during the presentation. Unfortunately, we only have the time to do a few of those questions. Now, if your question was not answered, please email dan at zithiamedicine.com to get that question answered. Okay, so to begin, Dr. Jacobs, does this drug migrate to deeper tissues? If so, would that mean that this drug could travel into the blood vessels and end up elsewhere? That's a very good question. So we have done animal studies where we put FGF1 topically on these uh, ulcers or wounds in, in animals. And remarkably, nothing, nothing gets into the blood uh, circulation. So that's very good because we don't want really FGF1 circulating around uh, in <clears throat> individuals. Remember, we're doing this over a five month period. So five months of exposure to FGF1 is something we don't want inside the body. So certainly uh, we're happy that this remains uh, outside in the wound where it's needed. Thank you. Another question to Dr. Jacobs, would this drug trigger melanoma or other forms of skin cancer? Uh, <clears throat> we looked at that carefully uh, in our heart trial uh, where we saw no rise in tumor markers. Lots of animal studies have been done with FGF1. It does not initiate any type of cancer, uh, but it, it is a potent growth factor. So you don't really want it around if someone has a cancer. Uh, so if anyone, we screen our patients, both in the diabetic foot trial and our other clinical trials for any active cancer. And if they have active cancer, they're excluded from the trial. Uh, but if, they, if, they, if they've had cancer in the past, but it's been six months or longer, we will enroll those patients in our trial. Okay, we have another question here. Dr. Jacobs, when the drug is approved, will the drug be sold over the counter or only via prescription? Yes, this will be a prescription drug, uh, but it's something that you could use at home. So <clears throat> you get it as a prescription drug, but you can keep it in your refrigerator. It'll, it'll be in a little eyedropper. And every other day you can you know, put drops of FGF1 on your diabetic foot ulcer, cover it with a special bandage, which will also supply to you. And this can be done at home. You obviously visit your doctor you know, at regular intervals to make sure things are healing well. All right, thank you, Dr. Jacobs. We have another question. This will be the last one. Can this okay. drug be used as an anti-wrinkle medicine? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Uh, <clears throat> it's actually being sold in China and Japan uh, in an anti-wrinkle cream. Uh, there's been no clinical trials uh, to support that, but there's been some good results. I mean, it's selling over there. And so, uh, that's something we probably would look at uh, at some point. Okay, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for questions today. If your question was not answered, please email dan at zithiamedicine.com to get those questions answered. We will now be moving on to the closing statements from Dan and Tom. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for watching our webinar presentation on diabetic foot ulcers and venous ulcers. Now, a lot of you are new for the first time to finding out about Zitia. And our goal is to inform people of what GEECH is doing, our medicines, our search for participants in our clinical trials, and for our advancements. So first of all, GEECH is a Las Vegas-based biotech company. We started in California. Unfortunately, uh, we had to move to Las Vegas because of health issues that I had. I was getting very sick in California. I discovered that I was hyper allergic to taxes so we moved the company to Las Vegas, where we are the, one of the leading biotech companies here. Our primary drug is a biological drug which stimulates therapeutic angiogenesis. And our drugs address what I believe are the primary cause of death for over 50% of all the people on earth. That includes heart disease, strokes, peripheral artery disease, diabetic foot ulcers, and a lot more. I believe we have a very exciting portfolio, and I believe that will be advancing rapidly towards approvals. So Zhich's business is the discovery of how does the drug work? What are the medical indications? Discovery of how the drug works, what are the medical indications, and how it may be applied safely to treat these diseases. 
Our business is designed also to carry out clinical trials to demonstrate that the drug is safe, effective in humans, and that diseases are caused by a lack of blood flow. And thirdly, our job is to interact with government agencies to obtain regulatory approval so the drug can be sold to the public. So our business is very simple. Discover how it works, how it benefits patients, how to use it, what are the correct dosings, design and carry out the clinical trials to prove that, and then to present that information to the regulators for approval. Now, for those of you who do not have a lot of information, we've created this booklet, Treatment for Health for Heart Disease, Stroke Recovery, Parkinson's Disease, Multiple Sclerosis, Alzheimer's Disease, Diabetic Foot Ulcers, and more. This booklet is a short booklet that explains what the biology is, what the methodology is, and the successes we've had in the heart, diabetic foot ulcers, and the information we have on our drug applied in Parkinson's to reverse Parkinson's disease. Additionally, Jack has written a white paper, Human Growth Factor FGF1 for Treatment of Diabetic Foot Ulcers. If you or anybody you love or anybody you care about wants to know more about what we're doing, and I think uh, Jack's presentation was very informative, I hope for all of you that this is a really dynamic application of our medicine, you can contact me and we'll send you out a copy of this white paper. Once again, people who have diabetes, this is a big deal. Next, our next upcoming webinar will be on Monday, August 24th. 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 noon Eastern, 6 p.m. Germany, 7 p.m. Saudi Arabia. Stroke recovery and therapeutic angiogenesis enhance the recovery from stroke. The World Health Organization says 15 million people suffer from strokes every year. Of these roughly a third, 5 million die. Another 5 million are permanently disabled. What we're concerned about is that 5 million that appear to be permanently disabled. I don't believe they are. I believe that the obstruction for blood to get to those areas of the brain has not been sufficiently repaired. So in our clinical trials, our objective is to take those people and to once again infuse our molecule and trigger angiogenesis and see if we can get blood to those people so that they can rehabilitate back to a more normal and happy life. And that seminar, I think, should excite you. The following one uh, will be coming up on September 1st. That one will be on peripheral artery disease. PAD affects approximately 10 million Americans. These people have pain when they walk. It's the third leading cause of uh, death from cardiovascular in the world. It's estimated 73% of the cases occur in the Middle East and Asia. Uh, revascularization of the, the legs is now possible through therapeutic angiogenesis, we believe, and we'll go through that data. Now, I wanna make a comment. I had a conversation yesterday afternoon with a doctor who specializes in treating PAD. And he was trying to explain to me that we gotta get going on this. This is just such a major disease throughout the, the uh, United States, especially to certain ethnic groups. This is huge in the Hispanic community, it is huge in the African American community. Now, the purpose of our outreach program is very simplistic. We wanna make you aware of our science. Uh, I had a conversation with a person yesterday who for the first time found out that we had grown blood vessels in the human heart. That person is a no option heart patient. That person was explaining to me, this is the biggest breakthrough ever, life is wonderful. And he's so glad he, he, uh, he finally found us because of our efforts. Well, there are millions of people out there that are suffering from these diseases. And I believe our efforts, our science, our medicine can change the outcome of their life. But before we get their support, they have to know we exist. The old saying of, if you make a better mousetrap, people will come to you, is wrong. If they don't know you exist, they're not coming to you. And so there's an old saying in marketing, which is, the people you seek are seeking you. They just don't know where to find you. Part of our task now is to go out and tell people what we have, that we can enhance their health, we can enhance their life. 
We should have millions of people supporting our efforts, and that is part of our effort. And then we want to develop a, develop a network of motivated, informed individuals, people who know our science, people who can share with others what we're doing, people who can spread the word and bring in new recruits. We presently have over 40,000 followers. Uh, over the next 60 days, we'll be reaching out to over 1 million people. In fact, last week, we reached out to over 600,000 in one major effort. The response has been overwhelming. Now, in conclusion, if you have any questions, email me your questions. If you want to apply for our clinical trials, you can go to our website, zgm.care. If you want to see more videos, you can go to zgm.care, and there are videos that we have from prior money shows on almost all the indications. We have a special video on uh, Parkinson's. Uh, also, if you go to YouTube and you look at Zicha, uh, medicine, Zicha Genesis, you can see that we have several YouTube presentations there. And we hope that you will be able to learn more about what we're doing and that you become comfortable to tell those people who are in need of this information that there may be hope for them to treat their horrible disease. This is Dan Montano. I thank you for your time and may God bless you all. Have a good day.